By the way, uh, during the song service, um, we are informal here. We're primitive Baptists, so we do things very simply. If you see a hymn in the hymnal that you'd like to sing, you just call that out. And if we can sing it, we, 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 we'll do that. Pay attention to the words. The word kindred literally means family. Hmm. Oh, and then, then Christ for this dear sake of I Thank you. 
service. So I hope everybody can uh, be here for that and take part in it. Also, Brother Todd and Sister Lisa are over at uh, Palm Chapel this morning. Uh, Brother Todd should preach for them uh, this morning. Sister Jimmy Ann, uh, great, I'm going to pray this. Uh, she's not up front there, but Sister Jimmy Ann has got some pretty serious issues and is finally able to see some doctors, and uh, hopefully she'll get some answers here soon as to what her problems are. I want to mention you know, one other thing uh, before it starts to remind as far as the schedule. <clears throat> The ordination of Brother Todd Nunley is, um, it looks like the best time, timing for that is on Saturday, July the 17th. Um, and you all think about that and check your calendars and hold me today. Let me know if there's a problem with that date. Um, because uh, uh, there's only a few days available where we can get uh, a good number of our brethren with us. <clears throat> we need to be in prayer for our, 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 our president all the leaders of our country at this time, the confusion and the turmoil in our country continues. And we need to pray that God will intervene. We need to be in prayer for our first responders, military folks, law enforcement, medical folks, utility workers, all those people who rush to the scene um, to help us when we're uh, in, in a difficult state. And many are still recovering from Hurricane Michael. We need to continue to pray for them. But one is, has persistent headaches. Just pray for him that the Lord would just relieve him of that. My daughter, Sister Angela Dixon, is improving. We're very thankful for your prayers for her. Sister Donna Dobson, Sister Rhonda's sister, we need to continue praying for her. Brother James Hoskins has already had one eye surgery. He's going to have the other one this coming week and on April 23rd. Brother Robert Lane Ham, we need to continue to pray for him. He's doing better. Is he good? Okay, very good. Thank you. I love good reports. And uh, Sister Lisa McDonald um, with Parkinson's disease, continue to pray for her. For the Todd uh, Nunley is to have a skin cancer removed, and we need to be in prayer for him. Sister Beverly has a thyroid issue and to see the doctor on the 23rd, so please be in prayer for her. And uh, my wife, Sister Sarah, um, I've already sent out the emails and everything. She has been uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and we're to see uh, specialists in Mobile as soon as they can get the arrangements made so that we can get over there and hopefully find out what kind it is and then still have a treatment. So appreciate your prayers. My daughter, Andrew Colvin, is beginning to improve, so appreciate your prayers for her. Um, um, Eugene Dukes. His brother, Ron. Calls from the second out in Oklahoma. That's his uncle-in-law. It's his, his wife's uncle. Okay. His wife's uncle. They, they thought he had. A, they didn't know what was wrong with him because he was unresponsive. Thought he was dying. Yeah, but it turned out to be a seizure. Um, that he was caught, had him unresponsive. My goodness. So he's improved. Some. So he's improved. Some. So well, good. That. Well, we'll keep him on the prayer list. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Stan Gap, continue to pray for her. Sister Felicia's brother Annie, continue to pray for him. The Jerry Hall's kid. Want to put him on here. Um, he's been having some uh, difficulties here lately. We need to continue to pray for him. Let him know we've got him prayer list, okay? And um, Sandy Holly, um, uh, uh, Nikki's mom, uh, there's a long story behind that, but um, she is uh, being moved to a hospice facility. We need to continue to pray for her and for Nikki as she cares for her mother. Um, Sister Beverly's co-worker, April of Johnston, her mother-in-law, was getting two weeks to live about a week ago, so we need to continue to pray for that family and for her. Uh, Brother Todd's dad, who James Nunley, is recovering from having a pacemaker installed, and he appreciates our prayers. And our little great-grandson, Caden, uh, Sam, uh, please continue to pray for him. We're still trying to find out what his issues are, and he's being examined for a tumor on his tissue. Is there any MRI of 28? 28. Uh, Mr. Michael Bodie's daughter, Tracy, continue to pray for her, and um, uh, uh, Brother Joe's neighbor's uh, uh, sister, Wanda Thrasher, Thrash Blasner, continue to pray for her. She has pancreatic cancer, mm -hmm. and Dakota Walsh, Walsh has uh, re-injured his back, and we appreciate the interest in our prayers. Anybody else have a prayer request this morning? Yes, I was going to get to her in just a minute. Okay. Go ahead, you go ahead and tell her. <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just 
Susan went through some serious surgery, and I know about some of that surgery, and yeah, a lot of pain associated with that. By the grace of God, she walks like now, like nothing's ever happened. The Lord is good. He answers prayers. Okay. All right. Anybody else? I have to say this. I have to say this. We're glad that our daughter and son in law here. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, military and children. Yes. Um, our military folks who are in a very difficult spot right now, and if you see the news, um, those kids that are being uh, abused, uh, and mistreated mm -hmm. down along the border, that just, we just need to pray for those kids. They're, they're, they're innocent of all this. Yes. So we just need to pray for them. Yeah. Yes, and the work day uh, is uh, next Friday at 9.30 here. The news can come out there. Okay. All right. Bad. Brother Rick, you can just stay in your seat and all prepare for us. Okay. Out of Brother So much gracious and merciful Heavenly Father and Lord, we come before that great throne, knowing you are the great I am, Lord, mm -hmm. the creator of all good things we find on earth and in heaven. And Lord, we come to you humbly before that throne. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray today that you lift up all that was mentioned here today, Lord, and mm -hmm. we may have neglected to mention it. Yes. That you grant them grace in their time of need. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray that it would uh, be the will that you could heal those that are sick. Yes, Father. Lord, we pray that our first responders, the military, mm -hmm. the police officers, the firemen, mm -hmm. uh, and it goes on, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you be with them and guide them, Lord, and mm -hmm. protect them as they go in harm's way to protect us, Lord. Yes, Father. Lord, we pray for uh, that you be with us here today. Give us the ears to hear, and Lord, give our pastor the, the words that mm -hmm. we could understand, Lord, and we could learn more about you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray to be with the pastor and grant him preaching grace mm -hmm. once again as he stands before us. In Christ's precious name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Look here. <coughs> 171. <clears throat> God's angels in Deep sound. 
Lo guapo, mi chico non va a fare fuori. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank thee again today for being able to meet mm, and study thy word, hear thy word, praise the Lord. Yes, and Lord, as always, we pray for each and every one that is here and that is absent. Mm. And Lord, we know you will take care of them if it be thy will. Yes, and Lord, we always try to do thy will, mm. which is we always come short. Mm. But that's how come we have your almighty grace, Lord. Mm. And this we do pray in thy son's name to you. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We'll turn with me to hymn number 274. I'd like to see verses 1, 2, and 5. 1, 2, and 5. It's <coughs> got a comment on Facebook that says, I just love to hear y'all saying, y'all. <laughs> Live my spirit. Right. If you'd like to to be seen, the title is Thorny Desert. Dark and Pan is the desert. visitors with us. This morning, the Lord will be pleased, I'd like to approach a subject that I've endeavored to speak upon a number of times over the last couple of years, but each time I get started on it, um, <clears throat> my mind goes in a different direction. And that's the Lord's business, so wherever he leads, that's where we'll go. We just sang a hymn about young soldiers how they become weary in their struggles, the trials of life. The Bible is replete with military analogies in war fighting because we are in a spiritual warfare even right now. This is what the Apostle Paul says about that. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and began in verse number 13. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse number 13. The Apostle Paul says this, using military terms. He says, watch ye. 
Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. Now, why is that important? What, what is he talking about? Well, back up just for context to verse number nine, just briefly. Paul says here, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many, what? Adversaries. Adversaries. An adversary is one that is adverse to Jesus Christ, to his gospel, to his church, and his people. They do everything they can to oppose and fight against what you believe and who you are. Our country is in a mess right now. Um, confusion abounds. Suffering abounds. I believe that there's a core cause for that. That core cause is found in the Old Testament scripture that teaches us in Psalm 9, in verse number 17, where the psalmist says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. That word hell there means destruction. Turned into destruction that forget God. David wrote that. <clears throat> David's son Solomon reigned after him. And at the end of Solomon's reign, the nation was divided. They went on a few years, and then the northern nation, Israel, was conquered and destroyed. Went on a few more years, and the southern nation, Israel, was conquered and destroyed. Jerusalem was utterly destroyed, razed to the ground. All the implements of their worship were stripped away and taken away. That's the last time we ever hear of the Ark of the Covenant. The high priest attire, the umum and thummim, those two elements that the high priest would use in judgment, that ended it. God meant what he said. Jesus Christ looked out on the city of Jerusalem. He previously said, I came into my own, and my own what? Received me not. He looked out on the city of Jerusalem and he prophesied. There did not be one stone left upon another in that city. We find in 70 AD that that is exactly what happened. There were many adversaries to God. In the Old Testament, even before the children of Israel got into Canaan, the promised land, there were adversaries then. You remember the spies that were sent into the promised land? And ten of them came back and said, we can't do this. The problem is just too great. There's high wall cities and there's giants in the land and when we stand up alongside of them, we look like grasshoppers to them. We can't take them. That's the, they had forgotten that God had just opened up the Red Sea and left them across. That God had delivered them from Pharaoh in Egypt. They forgot that. They forgot that God had opened up the rock and water had come out of the rock. How soon we forget the sovereign power of our God. Once they got into the wilderness, they continued to forget. They murmured and complained. And they even turned to idols. What did they happen when they turned to idols? One time God set a fire among them. One time he sent uh, uh, serpents upon, among them. He opened up the earth, and, and, uh, and many of them fell into the earth and was closed up. So I want to ask you a question. Is God serious about our allegiance to him and our worship to him? Does he have a right to be serious? Yes, yes he does. I'm concerned. Has our nation forgot God? What happens when a nation forgets God? That is a nation that God has blessed. And they begin to turn away from God. How many times when you look through the Old Testament had God blessed Israel with, um, with everything? They were wealthy, they were well fed, they were secure in their homes, and then they would begin to turn from God 
to idols and immorality and ungodliness, then God would just say, okay, if you're not going to worship me, defend yourself. And then a great army would come in and conquer them and destroy them. And then they'd cry out to God and God would hear them. And, and because of his great mercy and grace, he would deliver them again. That's our God. So when Paul says, watch ye, watch for what? I want to introduce another thought here before we continue with that subject. I'm concerned that we get so complacent, so satisfied with what we have, that we forget where it came from. And we actually don't miss it until it's gone. Yesterday, about mid-afternoon, our power went out and it was out for seven hours, several hours. I, we are so accustomed to having power in our home that when my coffee got cold, I went to the microwave where the microwave wouldn't come on. I walked into a darkened room, I flipped the switch, the light didn't come on. Okay. It began to get a little bit warm in there and the air conditioner didn't come on. We missed it when it was gone. Will you miss the church when it is gone? Somewhere when on this earth, when the Lord comes back, there'll be a people worshiping him in spirit and in truth. I'm convinced of that. What the wicked don't understand is that when the church is gone, they suffer too. With the children of God active in their church and in their community, we have a sense of morality. When the church is gone, that morality is gone. When the church is functioning according to the word of God and people in the church are living in the communities and behaving in the communities, there's kindness in the communities. There's decency when the church is active. There's people who are honest when the church is active. There's brotherly love when the church is active. There's a sense of peacefulness and calm when the church is active. There's liberty when the church is active. I'm afraid that if we continue on this decline, we're going to find out what life is like without these things. Okay. Now, I want to give you another thought. God is sovereign. He's omnipotent, having all power. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere simultaneously. And he's omnificent. He created everything that is. Amen? Amen? But next to the sovereign God, do you know what the most powerful thing on this earth is? A faithful church praying to the sovereign God. He hears you because he loves you. He hears you because he chose you. He hears you because he loves you. And when you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Isaiah 1 and 19. Amen. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, let's consider some things for a moment. Now, folks who spent time in the military know what these terms mean, know exactly what it means. To watch, well, let me use, use a, another illustration before I get to that. To watch. This was illustrated to me while we were living in the great state of Wisconsin. I was working with some of the dairy farmers on the dairy farm, and there was weeds growing up out in the, around the barns. And when I walked across the yard, I walked in the trail where there were no weeds. I looked around in the... And the, the brethren up there, 
They weren't mindful of the weeds at all. They just walked through the weeds without even thinking. And it just didn't seem right to me. Then all of a sudden I, I realized they're not worried about snakes. <laughs> and I told them, I said, if you ever come to Florida, don't you do that. <laughs> because there's probably about a 90% chance that there's a snake in those weeds. Down here we learn to watch ye. When I was a kid, we'd go out the door and mom would say, you all watch out for snakes. That was her constant refrain. And there'd be times, there were several times we'd walk out, there was a rattlesnake or a water moccasin right there at the end of the steps. You better watch or you'll get bit. A person in the military knows that when they're in a hostile environment, you better watch. The message to the church is watch ye. Why? Because there are many adversaries. Folks who are adverse to you and who you are and what you believe. They want to tear down your sense of honesty and morality and integrity. They want to ruin your sense of peace and your joy in this life. But what they don't realize is that when they destroy it for you, they're destroying it for themselves as well. Now, We'll talk about what to watch for in a moment. Then he says, stand fast. He's talking to the faithful church of Jesus Christ and the children of God. Stand fast in the faith. The term stand fast means you hold your ground. That means that whatever is true and right according to the word of God, you don't compromise it. It doesn't make any difference what the government does, what society does, what your neighbor does, uh, what your closest relative does. It doesn't make any difference who does what. You stand fast in the faith. The faith in this context refers to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That word faith has many definitions and one of those uh, definitions is true and right. Who decides what the truth is, by the way? Jesus Christ Told, and, and John chapter 4 told the Samaritan woman, he said, the hour is coming and now ends when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in what? Truth. truth. Is truth important? Yes. For, look, two verses down, he says, and they must worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth matters. Well, what is the truth? You're to stand fast and not compromise the truth. People can make good arguments about a lot of things. But we're to stand fast in the truth. Does everybody agree with that this morning? Yes, I'd like to have universal agreement this morning that truth is necessary to worship our God. Amen. All right. We'll come back to that in a moment. Then he says, quit you like men. That means be bold and courageous. It doesn't make any difference what the adversaries throw at you or threaten you with. You be Bold and courageous. That's what it means to quit ye like men. Be of good courage. We're told that over and over again in the scripture. Be strong and be of good courage. How can I be of good courage when it seems that the adversaries are more numerous than we and more powerful? You can because you have an almighty God who is hearing your prayers. If there was a message that I could put in the ear of every child of God in the United States of America, it would be this. Stand fast in the faith. Amen. Now to stand fast in the faith means to profess it accurately according to the word of God. But it also means to live it. Don't just have your faith in the house of God. Have it on Monday morning in school, in the workplace, in the grocery store in the doctor's office, wherever you are, exercise your God-given faith and don't be ashamed of it. The Apostle Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed to call his name. I'm not ashamed to declare who he is. I'm not ashamed to declare what he's done for me. I'm not ashamed to declare his promises because his promises are sweet to me. Then he says, be strong. Now, how do you be strong? Well, we know, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ which uh, strengthens me. 
That's the source of our strength. But how do you, how do you be strong? Now, I'm 70 years old now. Can y'all tell? I, I look like I'm 20, I know, but uh, uh, I'm 70 years old. Well, and I realize that I'm not as strong as I once was. Now, I was doing some work around the house yesterday, um, and I had to pick up a very heavy object the day before yesterday it was. A very heavy object. When I, when I was 20 years old, I could have just picked it up with one hand and away we'd have went. No problem at all. I had to get, y'all laughed, Sarah was gone. <clears throat> y'all would have laughed if you'd seen this thing. But I had to get down on one knee and prise that thing up off the floor and rock backwards to get it to move. Then I had to drag it. I, I'm still suffering from it this morning. But now let me tell you something. One of the reasons why I'm, I lost that strength is that I have not exercised myself. And I've got some excuse, good excuses why I have not exercised myself. Y'all want to hear those? No. Mm. But the point is, I haven't exercised myself. So here's the application to us. If you want to be strong, exercise yourself in the Word of God. Know what the word of God says. Paul told the preacher Timothy to study, to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. Well, I was ashamed when I couldn't pick that thing up. You'll become ashamed when you get into a tight spot and you don't know how to handle it in a biblical fashion. Or somebody asks you a question like, are you a Christian? What is your answer to that? My answer is this. If you can't see it by my life, my life, me telling you wouldn't make any difference anyway. I showed this the other night. I was in a place the other day and a man uh, was wearing a baseball cap. Right across the front said, I am a Christian. Now, <clears throat> I'm still a country boy at heart. My thought was prove it. If you are, prove it. Just because you say you are doesn't mean that you are. Prove it. To be strong is to exercise yourself in the word of God. To do those things that we're commanded to do. Now, we'll come back to those in just a moment. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 1, <clears throat> just turn there just briefly. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 1, the Apostle Paul again used in very similar language, uh, to exhort us uh, to be strong and to stand fast and, and to behave ourselves according to the word of God. He says this, Galatians 5 and 1, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now that's beautiful language, isn't it? But what does it mean? You're to stand fast in the... What liberty do you have this morning? You have the liberty to go to the store. You have the liberty to go to town. You, get, you can get in your car and travel all the way across the country. You have the liberty to do that. That's not the liberty he's talking about. The liberty that he's talking about, you have been freed from the bondage of the law service. You've been freed from having to work your way to heaven. Did you know that? Jesus Christ came into this world to do something. What did he come in the world to do? Matthew 1 and 21, the angel told Joseph, for he shall save his people from their sins. So let me ask you this question. Did he do it? Yes. He did it. He freed you from that burden. He did it. You know how I know that he did it? Because in John 19, 30, one of the last things he said while hanging on the cross is three jewel words. It is finished. That means he had saved everyone that God the Father had given to him. So did he do that? Yes. He did. We have to stand fast in that liberty and not compromise it. It doesn't make any difference what anybody believes or says or does. That's the word of God. Amen. Now, Philippians 1 and 27. The Apostle Paul uses this kind of terminology over and over again. Philippians 1 and 27. He says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. 
In this context, the word conversation means your citizenship, how you live, how you present yourself. Did you know it makes a difference how you present yourself in the grocery store? Yes. It makes a difference how you present yourself in your workplace. It makes a difference in how you present yourself when you're in school. It makes a difference how you present yourself wherever you are. You know, it even makes a difference how you present yourself on the telephone. You know, you can mark the calendar and the clock. At about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the phone starts ringing. Hi, I'm Paul. And he's got a deep and strong accent, and he's not from Wisconsin either. <laughs> he's wanting to sell me something. You know, I, we get so many of those until my heart says, I'm about to do something. <laughs> But my Christian conversation says, be civil. So I do. I just hang up the phone. <laughs> just hang up the phone. I don't want to say anything ugly. Who knows? He might visit us someday. He might want to join our church. And then he'll remember the way I talk to him. You know, you're in a grocery store. And the lady running the cash register gave you the wrong change. She says, no, I didn't. You said, yes, you did. And then you get angry. How do you respond? Well, the Bible tells you, stand fast in the Bible. The Bible teaches you to be you therefore angry and just slap the stew out of her. <laughs> so it'd be you therefore angry and sin not. James talks about the little member, the tongue. He said, get a hold of that tongue. And stop the tongue. You're to be kind and gracious and humble and meek and gentle and loving. Showing brotherly love wherever you are. You know how we're going to win this battle? Of immorality and ungodliness and dishonesty and meanness in our country? We're going to win it. We're going to be winning by carrying what we believe to every aspect of our lives. And not being ashamed of the gospel of of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So he said, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That word becometh, we don't normally use it in language like, like, uh, uh, like it's used here anymore, unless you're in the military. Okay. We have some Navy folks, ex-Army, ex-Air Force. Okay. Now, in the Air Force, we were taught at the very beginning uh, uh, that there was conduct unbecoming an airman. Then the, the army was taught that there was conduct unbecoming a soldier. The navy was taught that there was conduct unbecoming a seaman. You know what that means? You're wearing that uniform and your behavior must reflect well upon that uniform. If what you're doing doesn't reflect well upon that uniform and the country that represents, you don't behave that way. You have a uniform too. And it's not printed on your hat. Who you are is to be portrayed in your behavior. I watched a law enforcement officer one time who stopped a belligerent guy. And I just stood there and watched this. He called him sir. He was kind and speaking friendly to him as he was putting handcuffs on him. I said, now that is what it means to be you therefore angry and sin not. The things that that guy was saying to the officer, it would have made me mad. I'd have grabbed my club. But he was displaying a godly attitude and behavior in a stressful situation. We're going to win this battle because... A faithful child of God knows how to handle stress. You know how you handle it? Hebrews 12 and 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. When somebody is mistreating you, Jesus knows it. He's able to help you through and deliver you and bring you peace when there is no peace. You know that. He is, as a matter of fact, he's able to bring peace even in the midst of a storm. He can pick up those big loads that you can't carry anymore. 
Well, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent. I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit. You know what that means? The one spirit of the gospel, the one truth of the gospel, the one joy of the gospel, with one mind striving together, one mind striving. You know, children of God, you know, our children strove once in a while. Do you know that? And there were times they had to pull up apart because they were striving together. That's one sense of that word. But this sense of the word is that they were striving together, pulling the load together. They were laboring together to pull the load together. They were standing alongside one another. They were ready to help one another. That's the way we're to be. We're to be ready to help one another, to encourage one another, to come to one another's aid. And when someone needs encouragement, we need to have some ready words to encourage. Somebody loses someone that they love. We need to have some words of encouragement to say to them. We need to put our arm about them. Go to their home and, and see about them and, and speak kindly to them and encourage them. That ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind. That one mind doesn't mean that everybody likes all the same things. I like some things that nobody else likes. Did you know that? I like bluegrass gospel music. Everybody don't like it. Okay. I like souse. Does everybody like souse? Most of you don't even know what that is. I'm not going to tell you either. I like that. Some of y'all like things that I don't like. Some of you eat rutabaggers. I'll pray for you. But there's one thing that we have in common. That one thing that we have in common is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That unites us and binds us together as team members in the service of our God. Supporting one another and helping one another. That you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, that's not the last time that Paul used that phraseology. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 1. <clears throat> Chapter 4, verse number 1 begins with the word, therefore. Therefore. So if I were to walk up to you and, and haven't seen you in several days, and the first thing I say is, therefore, you think, you're the one has got dementia. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So when the Bible says, therefore, doesn't it make sense to find out what the Bible has just said? Yeah. All right, let's back up. Okay. Let's go to verse number 20 in chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse number 20. Philippians 3 and 20. For our conversation is in heaven. That's, that's a good thought. Our citizenship is in heaven. How about that? We have, a, we have a home in heaven that's bought and paid for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is there. Our names are recorded there. He says, for our citizenship is in heaven... From whence also we look for the Savior. He's coming back. And what's he coming back to do? He's coming back to get everyone that he died for. Amen. All that the Father giveth me, I should lose what? Nothing. Nothing. But what am I going to do with it? Raise it up again at the last day. John chapter 6. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> do you look for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back? Do you? Yes. Who are you looking for then? These words mean something. Do you know that? Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know they mean something? Well, what do they mean? If you say, I'm, I believe in the Lord, you're saying, I believe that the Son of God owns me. He bought me with what? What was the price that he paid for you? His shed blood. He owns me. And you rejoice to say, he's my Lord. Do you believe in Jesus this morning? Amen. If you really believe in Jesus, what does that word say? What does it mean? Words mean things. The word Jesus means Jehovah is my salvation. Period. Not Jehovah and, but Jehovah is my salvation. Amen. Well, 
You believe in Christ, do you? That word Christ is a transliteration to come from the old word Messiah, which means one anointed. To be anointed means that one is set aside for a specific purpose. God the Father set aside his son for a specific purpose, and that purpose was to come into this people and save his people from their what? Sins. Sin. And we know that he did that. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, we anticipate him coming, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, these vile bodies, these sinful bodies, who will change these vile or sinful bodies, that it may be fashioned like in his glorious body, that means perfect and without sin, uh, without sin, unspotted in any way, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. What did he subdue unto himself? He got the victory. To subdue means to get the victory. First Corinthians chapter 15 is the resurrection chapter. He got the victory over death, didn't he? He got the victory over sin, didn't he? He got the, uh, the victory over those who sought to destroy him. Our Savior is a victorious Savior. Therefore, these things being true, therefore, he says, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and my crown. Do you believe that Paul loved those people? Yes. He loved them. He was sharing this with them because he loved them. This morning in Christ Jesus, I love you with a godly love. I desire the best and the greatest joy for you this morning. He said, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast. So, because these things are true, that word so means because it is true, so stand fast in the Lord. Well, what's the opposite of standing fast in the Lord? Well, I get lazy and slothful and begin to put other things in the place of God in my life. I begin to depend upon others and other things instead of God. Stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Now, First Thessalonians chapter 3. Turn there with me just briefly. First Thessalonians chapter 3. The apostle uses this language, military style language, over and over again. First Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 8. For the sake of time, go directly to the passage. For now we live, by the word, that kind of language, for now we live, that means you have a life. You know, when I was a, a young man in my late teens and early 20s, the, the adage then was, they just need to get a life. Yeah, need to find some happiness along the way. Need to find some peace along the way. Need to have some joy in life. So he says, for now we live, that is we have a life, a good life, a happy life. There's a condition attached to that. If ye stand fast in the Lord. I want to keep the joy that we have right now, don't you? I want to keep the peace and the liberty that we have right now. I want to be able to go out and do business with people with integrity, don't you? Okay. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 15. Let's touch this one before we go back. There's that word again. <clears throat> uh, Thessalonians 2 and 15. Therefore, brethren, what's, what goes before the therefore? Go back to 13. He says, now we're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. God hath from the beginning chose you to salvation. Where are my amens? Amen. He's done that. We'll talk about that in a moment. Chose you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. That word belief there means the reliability of the truth. Did God tell the truth? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, keep that in mind. Verse number 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. You know, that there is a gospel call. There's a spiritual call. That's uh, uh, John chapter 3 verses 1 through 8 being born again. That's a uh, spiritual call. But the gospel calls people to obey the gospel. Did you know that? 
It calls people to hear, to learn, and to obey. And the essence of the gospel is John the Baptist's words. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's him right there. A preacher that's worth his salt is always pointing toward Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Now, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, there's our language again, stand fast and hold the traditions which we have, which ye have been taught, whether by word or epistle. He's talking about those things that we have taught you and now have written them in the word of God. Stand fast in the word of God. Don't compromise. Doesn't make any difference who says what or who does what. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not going to have time to do what was on my mind to do. So I want to do something else. Do you believe what I've just said to you? Yes, we're to watch ye and stand fast and we're to quit ye like men. We're to be a good courage. And we're to do it meekly and humbly. All right? We're to stand fast in the gospel. Let's just start right there. We'll deal with that. So what is the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel literally means good news. The good news of the Lord as pertaining to you. Now, open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> this is a much used page in my Bible. I visit here often. You know why? Because it means so much to me. It's an encouragement to me. Now, if you believe what I've just said to you, that we're to stand fast in the gospel, what is the gospel? What makes you feel good out of the word of God? Well, the whole thing does, but there's some things that just shines above all the others. Would you read with me and follow with me, beginning in verse number 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Amen? Amen. Yeah, we've got a good father. We've got a good son. Uh, God the Father, God the Son, he's blessed us right here today to put our mind on these holy things and get them off of the, off the evening news. I get about five minutes into Fox News and I turn it off. That's about all I can handle. Now, the Father, the Son, and the blessings. Stand fast. Be of good courage. Quit you like men. Be bold and courageous. Verse number four. Are you ready? Fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. According as he, that he is from verse number three, the Father. According as he, the Father, hath chosen us in him, Christ Jesus, when? That is awful weak. Let me hear it a little better. Before, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him and of. How did you get holy and without blame? Jesus Christ paid your sin debt. He washed your sins away. He glorified you. He justified you. And when did he do this? When he hung on the cross and he declared, it is finished. Amen. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. What was his criteria in choosing you and making you holy without blame? Amen. His criteria was his choice to love you. Amen. It was in love. Y'all agree with that? That's the text. You know what? That, that's a doctrinal point that I just read. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. What is the name, the title of that doctrinal point? This is almost like a Bible study, y'all. I'm sorry. No, no, no not really. Uh, Would you hold your hand there and go back with me to Romans chapter 9? You ever read Romans chapter 9? If you haven't, you ought to start. All right? <clears throat> Romans chapter 9 verse number 8, that is, Romans 9 and 8, that is, they which are of the children of the flesh, they are not the children of God. Do you know there are some that are not the children of God? I'm just reading it now. There are some that are not the children of God. But the children of the promise 
are counted for seed. There are those who are the children of the promise. What is the promise? When did the promise have? According as, it, as he hath chosen us in him, when? Before the foundation of the Lord. That's the promise. All right. For this is the word of the promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a, si have a son. Now you know how old Sarah was then? 99. You know how old Abraham was? 100. So you folks who think that you're over the hill, maybe not. Do you know Abraham laughed? And Sarah laughed. They thought it was impossible. Let me tell you something. We've already discussed that we have a sovereign God. He's omnipotent. He's almighty and all powerful, even over these natural bodies. Yes. All right. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born. Are you ready? You reading this? For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. What's the criteria? The criteria is God's love. It's not whether you've done good or evil. That the purpose of God uh, according to what? What is that word? I want to hear it. The, the according to election might stand. It's going to stand. Whether anybody believes it or not, it's going to stand. But we're to stand fast in it. We're to be of good courage and declare it and to live it and profess it. It's not of works. How about that? Did you know that even belief is a works? It is. But of him that calleth, it was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I what? Is the word of God true? Okay, you believe it? You rejoice in it? We are to stand fast in these blessed truths. Now, back to Ephesians chapter 1. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Now here's another one of those words. Y'all have heard this before. Don't plug your ears. Just listen again. I rejoice every time I read it. Having, what is that next word? Predestinated. Having predestinated um, us unto the adoption of children. You believe in the doctrine of predestination this morning? Look right here before you answer the question. You believe in the doctrine of predestination this morning? Yes. I just read it. Having what when did he predestinate this? He told us in verse number four, before the foundation of the world, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Now, Paul's right there. Why adoption? Because God the Father has only one begotten son. How about that? His only begotten son. The rest of the children of God are as adopted in. Sure, legally, under the mind and the purpose of God. Now watch this. By the way, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, who did this adoption? Jesus Christ. By Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. I believe in the free will doctrine, don't you, this morning? You know what the free will is? The, will, the free will is the will of Jesus Christ. He chose you and adopted you according to his will. Amen? Amen? All right. To the praise of the glory of his grace. He gets all the praise for it. Not man, not anybody, not any institution, not even the church, but only he gets the praise for this. Okay. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now how about that? Words mean things. You're accepted in the beloved who is Jesus Christ. And what did you do to become accepted? Nothing. He made you accepted. How did he make you accepted? You were made accepted in the beloved when Jesus Christ uh, allowed himself to be crucified. He shed his blood and gave his precious life. He made you accepted in himself. And accepted to who, by the way? To God the Father. He now presents you to God the Father as justified, glorified, redeemed, washed from your sins, prepared for heaven. Jesus Christ did it and only he could do that. Amen. All right. Verse number seven. In whom, that is the same Jesus Christ, the whom, in whom we have something. What do we have? 
If you have something, does that mean you might get it tomorrow? If you have something, does that mean that you could get it? Or that you had it one time? In whom, right now, in whom we have redemption through his what? Is there an and after that? Not through his blood and anything. It is through his blood exclusively. You ha- what have you been redeemed from, by the way? Let me give you Paul's words. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, O wretched man that I am. You know what that is? A child of God, born of the Spirit, looking at themselves in the mirror said, Father, I am not worthy to be your child. I am not worthy to be numbered among your children. I'm not worthy of a home in heaven. I'm not worthy to sit down among the saints in the house of God. I'm not even worthy to come before your throne and pray to you. I'm a sinner. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He says, I tell you what makes me worthy. I tell you how I can get to this place where I can sit down with the saints. I can go to the throne of grace and appeal to my God. I come because of Jesus Christ. O wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death. I thank God through Jesus Christ my Savior. My salvation has delivered me from that state. And now I can therefore come boldly into the throne of grace. Where I may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4 and 16. To whom we have right now... Redemption through his blood. And we have the forgiveness of sins. We are in possession of it even now. According to the riches of his grace. You believe in the doctrine of grace? Yes. Grace? What does grace mean? My Savior saved me and I wasn't worthy. My Lord died for me and I wasn't worthy. Isaiah 54 tells us that we did all the sinning, but Jesus Christ did all the saving. Verse number 8. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. You know what the mystery of his will is? We are children of God by his grace and not by our works. Okay. Skip down to verse number 11 for time. In whom that same Jesus Christ, in verse number 10... In whom also we have obtained. There's something else that we have. Have obtained. How did you obtain it? In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being what? There's that golden word again. Predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. He did it. He chose you. He died for you. And he secured your home in heaven right now. So like Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. You can say that by the grace and mercy of our God, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And one of these days, my eyes is going to look at him. Amen. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Jesus. Now, I want you to go back with me just briefly. In close, I didn't get to the heart of my subject even now. I want you to think about this a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse number 9, there are many adversaries in our country right now. But I'm going to tell you something. I have a feeling that there's a lot of folks just like us this morning who love the Lord Jesus Christ and want to worship him. And you know, we don't always walk around with it on our cap. But if you spend a little time around people, you can soon see the Spirit of God coming out in their attitude, the behavior, and the things that they say. It becomes evident. There's a lot of good folks. I say good because they're they're good citizens of Jesus Christ in in this country. They're not all primitive Baptists. They're not all Baptists. They're not all members of a church somewhere. They're good people under the leadership of God. They're honest, they're moral, they're kind, they're gracious, and they're helpful. I believe that God has preserved this country right now because 
there's still a whole lot of his children here that he's going to protect. But there are many adversaries. So what is our duty in the face of these adversaries? One is be on the alert. Be watch. Watch ye. And what do we do? We watch for error. We watch for sin. We watch for, for abomination. We, we, we watch. Well, <clears throat> if they tell you that you cannot bow your head and pray, or that if you're going to pray, you're not going to pray, but you're going to have a moment of silence. Now, I'd like to ask this question. What good does a moment of silence do? Nothing. Nothing. Does that speak to God? What about these golden words, let us bow our heads and pray? Let us pray. And leaders ought to stand up and pray. Not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those of, when I was in school, every morning, the first thing that we did is have prayer in the class and the teacher prayed. She was a Pentecostal. A sweetheart, a darling. Theology was different, but she loved the same Lord that I loved. And she prayed. Sometimes the principal would come on the PA system and pray aloud to everybody. What happened to those days? Now we're sending our kids to prison, to jail. We can't build prisons fast enough. You know why? Because Jesus Christ and the word of God is being removed from public life and from school. I've been in the prisons. I've sat and talked to those kids. I've cried with them. I've prayed with them. I have no idea why they're in that condition. What happened to them? They ask the question. Begin to talk to them. Don't know who mom and dad is. Preacher, I've never been to a church. Well, I did. I went to a church one time, went to a funeral. Preacher, you gave me the first Bible that I've ever owned in my life. The kid was 20 years old. And there's a lot of them. You walk in those prisons, the hallways are full of those kids. Lost to joy and peace and happiness in life. Because there, nobody cared for them and nobody taught them. Mom and Dad didn't teach them. Yeah. You ever wonder why Moses... In, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 was so emphatic when he said to the parents speak to your children of these things when you rise up in the morning when you sit in your house with them when you're in the way with them and when you lay down at night that's pretty much all time parents need to get those electronic devices out of their children's hand and be, speak to them concerning the things of God Exercise them. My kids sometimes got a little bit aggravated with me. Many years ago, living in Crestfield, it's 100 miles away. We would travel back to the church. And uh, we come to church and the kids always knew that they had to pay attention and make notes because when we got back home we had a device so that they could watch a movie but they couldn't watch the movie on okay. the truck that time SUV until they told me every passage of scripture that I had used and what I said about it now it wasn't just to applaud myself but that was to keep their attention to focus upon the word of God Amen. it is so important Paul writes and teaches the parents, uh, the fathers in particular, to bring your children up in the nurture that is feeding, in the nurture and the admonition of God. That means teach them the word of God. We used to, after our supper meal, we would have a family devotion, we'd have prayer together and sing some songs, didn't we? It's important to fill our children's minds with the gospel of Jesus Christ because I promise you there's adversaries that's filling their minds full of ungodliness. And it's sort of like the Lord told the Apostle Peter. 
The devil has desired to half thee, to sift thee as wheat. You know what that means? To strip from you happiness and peace and joy and liberty. He wants to have you. He's still at work. He still wants to strip, uh, sift us of all of our joy. So, we're commanded, using again Paul's language, in the very end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul said to be you therefore steadfast, unmovable, always, under all circumstances, always abounding in the work of the Lord. May God bless you is my prayer.
We thank you, Lord, for the words we've heard. We thank you, Lord, for those who have come to be with us today. Mm -hmm. Pray that each and every one has received a blessing for it. Lord, we thank you so much that you've made us to understand the truth, mm -hmm. that we know that salvation is by that grace and that grace alone. Mm -hmm. As we depart, Lord, keep these things close to our mind and our heart. Keep us mindful of thy will in all things that we do and say. Mm -hmm. And bring us back safely at the next point in time. These things we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 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 Amen.